Okay. In the interest of time, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, webinar series. For those of you that have become accustomed to this, this has been roughly about a monthly uh, occasion. We haven't done it for the last few months, but we do want to welcome you to today's webinar. If you've joined us before and you um, are familiar with these webinars, you're used to this slide here on, on the left where we picture what our network uh, currently looks like. And there are five different themed research investigations going on. These are different consortiums, each targeting and looking at different aspects of biology, all with the idea of doing two things really, trying to understand how human beta cells are lost and then thinking about ways to develop strategies to protect, replace, prevent the disease from, from happening um, to, to individuals. And so when you look at this, um, it's, a, it's a pretty large network and um, you know it's been around for almost 10 years now, not quite 10 years, and it's engaged a lot of the, a lot of the minds in, in the field and some not in the field, but not all. And um, HERN is changing, and this is something we want to make you aware of. This is what HERN is going to look like in the future. The two um, circles, the two blank circles, represent um, some of the biggest changes happening in HERN. The one on the right, the pancreas knowledge base uh, program, was an RFA that was released in March. And we expect any day now that NIH will announce the awardees for that initiative. But... There is an, an RFA that is out on the streets now, and so you do have an opportunity to engage with HERN. I'll tell you a little bit about that in, in just a minute. So um, again, as I said, over, over 10 years, there's been 800 researchers. Now that includes investigators, postdocs, pre-docs, um, faculty, you know, all manner of, of, of investigators through HERN. And you'll notice that's a lot of people but there's about 200 now. So you can imagine there's a lot of turnover and that's by design. People come into this modular network and, and they leave and some people come back, but it is an opportunity to engage with others and also to look to what's, what's happening in, in the future. So if you wanna know more, there's a lot of different um, things going on and our website's obviously the way that, that you can find out. Again, I mentioned the funding as, as being one of them, but we have a lot of other um, aspects to the website. Uh, you know, you can um, see the meetings that are coming up, different announcements, uh, job opportunities, for example. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things to you. If you want to follow us, you can um, subscribe to these various uh, channels uh, that, that we have. Um, we're also cataloging the different resources that um, investigators in HERN are generating, whether that's antibodies, whether that's data sets, cell lines, constructs, et cetera. You can get an idea of what's available and what people are using if you visit, if you visit our website. Um, so this is uh, um, a quick look at the different uh, data sets that, that are available and you can quickly look through those. Now, uh, again, I mentioned um, the uh, YouTube, or maybe I didn't mention the, the YouTube page that we have, and this is where all of our webinars go, and probably most of you know about it. This is where today's webinar will go after um, Wendell will give this presentation to us. So um, if you subscribe to our newsletter, and again, you can do that on the website, you'll uh, learn about the studies that are coming out, um, different members and what they're up to, uh, the webinars again uh, that, that, are, that are happening, job opportunities. So on our, on our page, um, it's not only uh, looking for RAs, it's also looking for faculty members. There's a, there's a few faculty positions that are currently uh, available. So there's quite a number of, of job openings in academia largely. I don't think we have any openings currently that are in industry, but you can take a look there. And then I mentioned the different funding initiatives. And this one is a consortium on modeling autoimmune diabetes. And one of the things I didn't tell you is that Two, two networks that are currently in HERN, the Consortium on Modeling Autoimmune Disease, and then there is a, a consortium, a, a group of engineers who are trying to develop strategies 
to look at um, different aspects of diabetes on a chip, for example. And so this one is trying to bring elements of both those consortia together. And so you can uh, check that out. Uh, I think the RFA for that is due or the the um, the grant is due in March. So you have some time to to check that out. So with that, um, we're gonna we've got an exciting uh, agenda today, and Dr. Lim is going to walk us through these various topics. Um, as I told you, th these meetings are going to be recorded, so please try to keep your camera off and um, mute. We'll have we should have plenty of time at the end to ask questions, or you can do so in chat. And so as I stop sharing my screen and hand off to uh, Dr. Lim, and he can go ahead and put his his up. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Lim. He did his undergraduate at Harvard. He did his PhD at MIT. Then he postdoc'd at Yale. And then from there, he went to UC San Francisco, where he's been for um, for over 20 years now. And he's he's been pretty busy over there. He's uh, taught over 70 classes, 6,000 students. He's mentored um, over a hundred different faculty, postdocs, pre-docs, um, and he's managed somehow to um, establish a pretty thriving research program. Um, and his work is very relevant to Hearn as significant efforts are currently underway in, in our network aimed at modeling and engineering immune and cell solutions. So today what we're gonna hear is about an interesting collection of tools and strategies that Dr. Lim and his team have been developed, uh, that have been developing that can be used in type one diabetes. So with that, uh, Dr. Lim, I'd like to invite you to um, walk us through the work and uh, the stuff that you guys have been doing. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me just see, okay, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, it looks great, thank you. Okay, let me just move some things out of the way. Can I do that? Sorry. Um, okay, I'll just I'll just go ahead and uh, but it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And what I'm going to try to do today is to introduce you to some of the uh, approaches and tools that we've been developing in synthetic biology. Uh, and really looking forward to your feedback on ways that we can apply these to problems in type one diabetes. Um, so uh, really, the the problems that I'm going to try to focus on today are. Um, two of the critical problems in T1D treatment, which is one, what are the ways that we can protect islets from immune attack, uh, whether that's uh, autoimmune attack or rejection, if we're looking at transplant. Uh, and then also, how do we make islets? How do we make better islets that are highly functional, transplantable, et cetera? Um, and so the, uh, the first part I will talk about our effort to engineer synthetic suppressor cells that could block this kind of attack. And the second part of the talk will be on uh, synthetic approaches to program and drive development or organoid self-organization. That second part, I just want to warn you, is not going to be uh, specifically about islets and pancreas, but more about approaches and uh, really with the open question of, you know, could this be applied to uh, problems relevant to type 1 diabetes? And I, I hope so. Um, so I'm going to try to break this up into bite-sized chunks. First, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction about the kinds of tools that we've been developing to rewire and control cell-cell uh, -cell communication and interactions, and then describe to you some of the applications, particularly in the area of uh, cells, T-cells, that are uh, engineered to, to kill cancer with very much more sophisticated uh, behaviors. Uh, and then I'll go into our effort to try to apply these tools um, to uh, synthetic uh, immune suppressor cells that could control inflammation, autoimmunity uh, in a local rather than systemic way, and the kinds of uh, alternative solutions that we've been exploring and uh, data that show that we can protect islets from T cell attack with these tools. And then I will go into oops, um, uh, our work on synthetic development, new ways to drive um, organoid uh, development in vitro, particularly trying to use um, what we call synthetic organizers, cells that are engineered to organize around progenitor cells and provide morphogenic signals in a very spatial and temporally controlled way. Okay, so uh, just before um, I start, I want to really thank the great team of scientists and collaborators that have been part of this work on the synthetic suppressor cells. This is a great collaboration with Matthias Hebrock and Audrey Parents Labs. 
Uh, and uh, Nish Reddy uh, has, is the, the person who's been leading this. He's on the call, so hopefully he can um, uh, help with uh, uh, answering the tough questions that you might have. And then in terms of the synthetic organizers, uh, that's a great collaboration with Ophir Klein uh, and Benoit Bruneau, uh, but led by Atoshi Yamada and Coralie uh, Trensel. Okay, so let me first try to introduce, you know, what we mean by synthetic biology. And really it's trying to uh, use an engineering mindset to try to understand the design rules uh, of complex biological phenomenon, and then try to use that and harness those to create novel cell behaviors. And um, I'm gonna start with the premise that really a lot of the interesting biology that we're interested in uh, involves cells talking to each other in networks, whether it's immune cells or neurons or whatever. And so in a lot of ways, what to, to both understand these and to try to make new behaviors, um, what we would like to do is to be able to figure out fairly simple ways to rewire these networks, to make new connections between cells that talk to each other. Um, so um, what are the things that we would like cells to be able to say to each other? We'd like inputs from other cells to be able to tell a cell on the right side here um, to uh, do different, you know, really just a handful of core functions to be able to produce outputs like signals that can be uh, uh, transmitted to other cells. They should be able to move or change their shape, to adhere, to proliferate. And so really what we've been thinking about for some time is that we'd like to uh, figure out genetically encoded commands that allow us to, in a flexible way, program these new kinds of relationships. And so as a result of that, we've engineered a number of different things. I'll show you some examples. Now, a canonical example that many of you are probably familiar with are chimeric antigen receptors, which work, of course, in T cells. And um, the outer part is a, um, uh, a SCFV or some kind of programmable sensing uh, unit, uh, this red domain. Um, but then it has the inner part of the uh, uh, TCR and, and uh, co-stimulatory receptors that then now allows one to reprogram the T cell to recognize a new signal, a new antigen, and then to stimulate this proliferative and, and killing uh, response. We have more recently have been developing what we consider a little bit more generic tools. One of them is the synthetic notch or notch receptor, uh, uh, which is, or SID notch receptor, which is, um, again, has an extracellular SCFV or programmable extracellular recognition domain, but hooked into it is a notch a sensing domain that gets cleaved upon engagement of this receptor. And that releases an engineered transcription factor that now can drive the expression of any genetically encoded payload from that cell that's driven by that promoter. So it's a really flexible way of sensing something new and then really creating any kind of new um, response that you can encode in a gene or a set of genes. We also have other things that we've been working on, like SYNCAMs or synthetic adhesion molecules that really control what cells, will, who, how they will adhere to one another. Um, and these, again, have uh, uh, flexible um, ex extracellular recognition domains, but then we can also program them based on the intracellular domains for the kind of strength and kind of interactions that they make. And then we're also working on synthetic um, uh, migratory chemokine receptors. So the idea is that this is a set of tools that um, that that can allow us to change or uh, add new behaviors to cells. Um, so uh, we've been using these and trying to use these kind of as words to speak the regulatory language of cells in two different ways. Uh, one area is in, in looking at immune cells like T cells and trying to program, for example, their ability to kill tumors in a very specific way. On the right is an example of trying to, where we've engineered actually cell lines, uh, fibroblast cell lines to kind of interact with one another and then induce a cascade of different responses, including expression of adhesion molecules, different ones, and new signals. These actually now can be programmed to create these uh, artificial self-organizing, uh, self-autonomous you know, circuits uh, that that, um, that that you see in the in the movie. There, uh, the key point is that we're looking for kind of a universal set of tools, almost like chemistry with chemical bonds, but now with cells uh, that will allow adhesion, transcriptional activation. These are the kinds of common currencies that are used throughout. So I want to go through some examples. Um, now, what the first one is is trying to engineer cars that have multi-antigen sensing capabilities. So if you have a car, it can recognize antigen A and kill a cell that has antigen uh, antigen B. I'm sorry, um, but um, it, it doesn't. It can't discriminate based on multiple antigens. So one simple way that we've done this is to link 
two receptors, two or more receptors really, into a cascade or a circuit. Here we have a synnotch receptor that recognizes antigen A, but then it drives a car for antigen B. And what this creates is a, a, a cell that requires two local antigens to kill. It, it not, must obey the command of if A, then kill B. Um, and so the uh, this is of course important because if you have say a car that recognizes one antigen that's in a tumor, but it's also expressed at some level in normal uh, tissues, uh, you will kill the cancer, but you might also get toxic uh, adverse reactions by killing these bystander tissues. Um, and so the idea is something like this, this kind of two input gate uh, can give you a cell that will uh, be able to get primed and then uh, activated to ex only conditionally express the car uh, in the right uh, location and then kill those cells uh, as shown here. But then um, uh, if this cell was to enter into that normal tissue where there are no of the priming green antigens, uh, it would be inert. Okay, so you can still get efficient, ideally efficient killing, uh, but uh, uh, exclude killing of this uh, uh, without the priming antigen. So um, let's see, next, okay, good. Um, so, you know, a way to test this, which we did uh, some years ago, is to have a dual tumor mouse where we have uh, a, a tumor that has two antigens, a killing and a priming one, but then one that only has the killing antigen in the bystander. Uh, and here, what we're hoping is that we put the cells in, when they enter the, the bystander tumor, they won't, they'll be inert, but then when they enter the tumor, they will get primed and then be able to kill. Okay, so uh, quite a few years ago, Cole Roigel did these experiments and show that um, if we have this, uh, we see this really selective tumor clearance of just the dual antigen tumor and not the single. So if you put the normal car, it would kill both of these uh, equally well. Uh, and this just shows the kind of dramatic effect that you can get where the T cells know where to go and where to activate their killing. So you get this mouse, for example, where only one tumor is clear, the other one grows uh, as if uh, there was nothing there. Okay, uh, another second example is that we've been able to use this uh, more recently to do uh, tissue targeting, where we can target the cell's activity just to a particular tissue. And we've done this in collaboration with Hideo Okada on glioblastoma, but we've designed cells that have a synnotch that recognizes brain-specific antigens. These cells, when they go to the brain, only in the brain, do they actually get primed to express a car that will now kill glioblastoma uh, tumor cells. And what's uh, really exciting is that this gets effective uh, tumor killing without killing of normal cells that express the CAR antigen outside of the brain. And this is very important because um, we can actually now use uh, the, the most so homogeneous uh, uh, antigens for killing uh, as long as they're only expressed in the brain. And it doesn't matter if they're expressed in other tissues in the body. And we're very excited that we're actually, we've just got our first IND approval for our first uh, phase one trial on using a synosh car cell therapy for GBM. So things are moving forward. The third example I want to give you is work that was done by Greg Allen um, uh, in the lab, who's now a, a, a faculty at UCSF. Um, and this is synosh driven delivery of cytokines, and particularly IL-2. So this is in, uh, that can help to overcome immunosuppressive tumor environments, in this case, in pancreatic cancer. And this is looking at syngeneic uh, PDAC tumors, that have the antigen mesothelin, the thing that is we know is that these are very uh, suppressed. And if you use a mesothelin car, uh, it doesn't uh, effectively kill uh, the tumor. That's what this black line is here in the plot below. But then Greg decided to add to this a synopsis circuit that will recognize a second antigen. In this case, we put in CD19 into the tumors. That's what it recognizes. But th this would drive um, expression of IL-2. And what's really striking is now we put this into the syngeneic tumors, a model, uh, mouse models, and we see uh, rapid clearance of and 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 really cure of the mice. They all survive. Um, really a dramatic effect. And when we go in and look at this, first of all, we see that if we just put the mesothelin car, uh, we see this typical T cell exclusion where they're stopped uh, at the at the boundaries of the tumor, um, and you don't see good T cell infiltration. But if he adds the IL two circuit to this, we see um, early on. Uh, a lot of infiltration and proliferation of the T cells. So really this is an example of effectively reading and remodeling a particular microenvironment that's a suppressive one with an uh, inflammatory cytokine like IL-2. Okay, so just to, to tie up this part, we've been able to engineer uh, with these tools, a bunch of things like multi-input 
uh, CAR T cells, tissue targeted CAR T cells, and also been able to remodel local microenvironments like the tumor through local delivery of agents. Uh, and all of these again are now we've uh, started or are developing uh, trials for multiple solid tumor therapies. Um, so the uh, um, the question is, can we now start using these to uh, look at um, other problems? And so I'm going to talk about uh, trying to turn this around. Can we actually design synthetic suppressor cells um, that can be used for treating autoimmunity or rejection in a targeted manner? And so this is work, again, that was done by Nish Reddy in collaboration with the Parent and Hebrock Labs. I also want to give a shout out to Jeff Bluestone and, and Tang, uh, who really, uh, my colleagues here, who who uh, got us interested in this area a number of years ago. Um, so of course, you know, many people are interested in harnessing and redirecting cells like Tregs uh, towards specific tissues, et cetera. Um, but Nish decided to try to take kind of a broader approach. Part of what we like about synthetic biology is it allows us to kind of deconstruct and reconstruct different solutions to a problem. And so what he decided to do is to, to explore what happens with a whole range of different payloads that can have some sort of suppressive or might have some suppressive functions? What if we make a cell that uses a syn notch to drive these different payloads? And uh, these are shown here in the middle of the slide. Uh, and um, he eventually, as I'll show you, looked at these individually as well as in combinations to try to understand, look at this whole space of, a, of suppressive programs and which ones were the most effective against what kinds of cells. Uh, and so we assayed these by having a three cell uh, assay with target cells that have both um, uh, have a CAR antigen, in this case HER2, and we have CAR T cells that are going to kill these, but the target cells also have CD19, which we use as a, to drive a syn notch in a, second, in a third suppressor cell that can then potentially have the ability to suppress those uh, killer CAR T cells. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna show all the data he collected, but some of it is here. Uh, this is a case where he's taking both, looking at in vitro suppression of CD4s and CD8s, looking at expansion uh, and activation markers. This is just looking at expansion of those T cells uh, when they're stimulated. Uh, and um, what you see is that there are selective payloads, uh, particularly things uh, that we would have expected like IL-10, TGF-beta, as well as PDL one that suppress um, uh, we see that actually IL-10 doesn't work well in this case against uh, the CD8. So we identify some effective single payloads and some differences between targets like CD8s and CD4s. Okay, um, but then uh, Nish went on to look at combinations of payloads. Um, and uh, we saw really that with certain combinations, uh, this is an example of looking at suppression of CD4s, CAR T cells, uh, we actually could get much, much better um, uh, suppression. And as you can see here, most of these involve combining a, a suppressive payload with CD25, uh, the, the high affinity uh, receptor for IL-2, uh, 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 which also acts as a sink for IL-2. So um, what we see is this kind of pattern that the best uh, suppressor cells or programs uh, combine both a, a, a suppressive cytokine as well as a inflammatory cytokine sink. Uh, and this just shows that when we look at this and looking at uh, combining CD25 with TGF-beta um, and looking in this case at target cell survival um, in this three cell assay, that we see that uh, just how much better uh, the combination of the two is at blocking both CAR T cell expansion uh, uh, and allowing um, uh, uh, target cell survival and expansion. Okay, um, so as you can imagine, you know, it's it's gratifying to see that this actually is in alignment with the evolved solution of, of Tregs that both have cytokine, uh, suppressive cytokines as well as IL, uh, inflammatory cytokine sinks. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we went on, Nish went on to, to ask a question of like, is it actually important to have the, uh, the CD25 and the TGF-beta uh, in one cell, or can you supply it by both? And what he found is that if you separate it into two different cells, it leads to much weaker suppression. And so um, he also went on to show that when we look at this, um, I want you to look at the, the plot here on the far right, that actually when you have the combination, you actually end up with a lot more TGF beta. So the model that we think is that um, not only does the CD25 act as a sink for IL-2, but it also helps drive the, the more effective proliferation of these suppressor cells. And so then the idea is that um, 
no, oh, I think I'm missing a slide. But that, oh yes, uh, more uh, proliferation begets more CD20, uh, TGF beta, that not only are you getting that effect of making TGF beta, but you're also getting this effect of proliferating those cells that are making uh, TGF beta. Okay, so uh, we wanted to test these in vivo. And the first way that we decided to do that is with a dual tumor model, where we're gonna have a single and a dual antigen uh, tumor. Uh, both of these are gonna have the killing antigen. And then, but one of them will have the, uh, the CD19, which is the Sinosh antigen. And so the question we had is, could we, if we put in uh, these two tumors that both have the killing antigen, HER2, um, and we put in a normal CAR T only, that we get clearance, uh, which is shown down here on the, on the left. Uh, plot. But um, what if we add, in addition to this, throughout the, the, we just inject IV, these suppressor cells that sense uh, CD19 and produce, uh, in this case, CD25 and TGF beta. And what we see here is we get really powerful uh, protection only of the dual antigen tumor, and we see equally good um, efficient killing of the single antigen tumor. So we can get this kind of very localized uh, suppression of a CAR T activity. And we think this is really exciting. This could be really important for blocking uh, CAR T responses in off-tumor off tissues that have the same antigen. That is, you could detect uh, a, a, a antigen that's only found in that normal tissue and protect it with this kind of um, blocking cell without hampering tumor uh, activities, killing activities. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of, we wanted to then see whether or not we could actually block autoimmunity and rejection with these same cells. Uh, so this is where we worked with uh, the Hebrock and, and parent labs. Um, and uh, if we, in this case, what we did is we took um, uh, uh, these um, uh, stem cell derived beta cell clusters, uh, EBCs, and then uh, the, which have both a CD19, which is a Sinach ligand, and then an HLAA2 naturally. Uh, and then we had an anti-HLAA2 CAR T cell as the agent that would kill these. Um, and if we look at those, those efficiently, those are the blue cells here, they efficiently uh, proliferate and start killing uh, the uh, EBCs. Now, if we do this assay, but add this CD19 driven Sinatra suppressor cell, we see that we can actually protect these cells uh, fairly well. Okay. And we don't see proliferation of the CAR T cells. Um, one thing that, that Nish noticed when he looked more closely is very interesting behavior. So normally, if you just have the CAR T cells, you see these blue cells expanding and killing the, the EBCs, which are in green. But then if he adds suppressor cells, which are in red here, he sees the formation of these kinds of clusters where um, the, uh, the, the suppressor cells act almost like a detergent around oil. They surround the, uh, the, the CAR T cell. Uh, which um, they probably are feeding, self-organized by feeding uh, on the IL-2 produced by those cells. And that's very similar to what's been observed uh, with normal Tregs and how they spatially organize around activated uh, CD4 T cells. Okay, so um, we then wanted to see if this could work in vivo. So we um, did uh, transplants of EBCs into the kidney capsule uh, with the same system. And then uh, IV injected both killer uh, CAR T cells uh, as well as suppressor cells. And what we see is that um, the transplant can be well protected um, in vivo uh, by uh, the, these suppressor cells as shown here. And this is with uh, luciferase in the EBCs. Okay, so um, importantly, this shows the difference that you see in the EBC survival uh, when you have EBCs with CD19, either treated with CAR T cells or CAR Ts plus the protective suppressor cells. But importantly, when you do this with EBCs that are CD19 negative, they don't have the synogen and they aren't protected. So really need that activating antigen uh, to target and activate the suppressor cells. And we went on to, just to show that um, uh, with a glucose challenge test that the protected transplants when stimulated with glucose still are able to produce uh, insulin. Okay, so to summarize, um, in this work, we've taken a synthetic bodily approach to try to deconstruct and reconstruct um, suppressive programs, immune suppressive programs, and we've defined a space of effective anti-inflammatory programs that includes something similar to what is seen in native Tregs. Um, these cells that we've made, the synthetic suppressor cells, can locally block a potent CAR T, -sac T cell attack, both in vitro and in vivo and protect uh, uh, beta cell um, uh, organoids. Uh, and that these we, we think um, 
provide a, a very modular and perhaps more tunable alternative for T-Rex for treating autoimmunity or rejection or blocking off tumor CAR T cells. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let me now go on to the last part of the talk, which is to turn our attention now to trying to steer organoid self-development. Uh, and what's shown here is actually, uh, I showed this before, but uh, some work from a number of years ago where we take uh, fibroblast cell lines and engineer them with synotch circuits that then where cells talk to each other, recognize each other, and when we mix them together, they start inducing uh, uh, cascades of induction of, of certain uh, adhesion molecules and fluorescent molecules, but they, the, depending on how we link them together, we actually can get these circuits, almost like developmental programs that lead to the kinds of diverse um, morphologies that we see here. And so we've been interested for a while in asking, could these sorts of tools be useful in guiding the assembly of, of or development of multicellular structures such as islets, um, which of course are made of multiple cells and need to be vascularized, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> And so one of the approach that we have been exploring uh, together with Ophir Klein's lab is this concept of what we call synthetic organizer cells. Could we actually engineer a small component of cells and to assemble and have certain properties in space um, that will interact with progenitor cells like ES cells in a spatially defined way, and then actually use these to produce morphogenic signals? Um, and, and what's shown here is just some of the the different kinds of architectures that we've been able to make. So uh, the concept here is that, you know, when we, uh, most efforts to look at in vitro development have involved taking ES or other progenitor cells and then treating them isotropically with morphogens in the media, uh, which of course you can vary time, but you don't really have control over space. Now in vivo development, of course, uh, progenitor cells are surrounded by an environment that has spatial asymmetry. And in recent really exciting results uh, with synthetic embryos, people like the Zernike Gertz and HANA labs have shown that you can take extra embryonic cells. These self-organize around ES cells and can actually start giving you in, vivo, in vitro synthetic embryos that really start looking, uh, start having AP axes and so forth. Um, what we thought is that, you know, what would be really interesting is if we could engineer synthetic organizer cells that could play a role of this kind of creating an environment. Could we program them to spatially organize and to produce defined morphogens of interest to really coordinate the control both of chemical and spatial signals in, in this, this uniform way, in a controlled way. So we wanted to ask, how do we program the, the spatial self-assembly? And I just need to turn briefly to a paper we published last year, um, which is uh, by uh, Adam Stevens, which was uh, programming cell assembly with synthetic adhesion molecules. And I'll just give a very short summary here, which is we showed that if we, we can make chimeric, a whole range of chimeric adhesion molecules that have, say, nanobody or SCV uh, interactions on the outside, but then have specific types of engineered intracellular domains that interact with the cytoskeleton. But depending on how we build these, we can control what cells will recognize one another and what kinds of adhesion interface and strength they will have. And we can use these to program uh, self-assembly through things like differential adhesion. Okay. So what we've been able to do is take mouse ES cells and then have engineered, uh, these are L929 uh, fibroblasts that we have, that we put in a collection of different native and synthetic uh, cell adhesion molecules, um, but then we can get them to form different kinds of structures, like we can have them form a node on one side uh, of, the, of the ES cell cluster, or a shell, or two nodes, or a node-shell combination as shown here. So then the question is, can we now start taking these different spatial arrangements and start expressing morphogens from that? And so we started by looking at one of the most important ones, WINT3A, uh, and expressing it from these organizers. And we actually combined it also with a two-node structure that expresses WINT and its inhibitor, DKK1. Okay, And what you see is that if you use a small molecule WINT uh, agonist uh, like CHIR, uh, in the media, you get uniform stimulation of the ES cells. If you put Wnt in the media, you get uniform, although it kind of forms a ring because it takes a while for it to get to the inside. If we provide it with a shell, we get a similar sort of structure. But what's striking is that now if we put the node on one side, we really start seeing this directional gradient. Um, and if we put uh, the opposing inhibitor 
uh, DKK1 on the other side, this red node, we can get a, uh, we can reshape that gradient that to, to have it be even steeper. So the, the point is that we now can control exactly the quantitative features of the gradient and, and, and how it's organized in space. Um, and you can see that once we get these gradients, I mean, one of the obvious things here is that you see this elongation happening uh, in the embryoid, uh, which is characteristic of, of, of normal uh, gas relation. Okay, so we get this range of gradients. What? How does that lead to different sorts of behaviors? Um, so again, this is, you know, we can have these shallow gradients made by a, a wind node, but the steeper ones um, with wind and DKK, we can also put DKK alone, which will have no wind activity. Um, and then uh, these are the kinds of things that we see. Uh, if we um, get uh, use the shallow gradient, what we see is that um, we uh, generate um, an embryoid that uh, has um, uh, sort of posterior fates, including a fairly large uh, part of with car cardiomyocyte uh, cells, cell lineages. Um, if we do something with just DKK1, this undergoes all anterior fates, so neural fates, which are shown in green here. Um, but if we do this with the, 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 the steeper gradient that goes from very high to extremely low uh, wind activity, we actually see this full uh, AP axis where we see kind of a head-like structure with neural tissues as well as the heart, et cetera, and the, the other posterior fates. Um, so the point is that we see we can generate uh, with these different gradients specific lineages that are organized in the appropriate uh, anterior to posterior sort of topology or arrangement, uh, but that importantly, the gradient uh, range and shape seems to determine the spectrum of the lineages that we'll observe, okay? Um, <clears throat> and this just shows uh, that, um, you know, these are really quite localized regions. So this is that that full kind of with a two node structure. And you can see the, the cardiac um, uh, tissues here uh, pointed with the arrow, but you see the beating is really localized uh, to that, that very specific region. Okay. Now we looked a little bit more carefully at some of these ones with just the wind node that made a more shallow gradient. And one of the striking things in, in, in a pretty large fraction of these uh, embryoids is that we not only got elongation, but this is following a KDR uh, mesenoderm reporter. And what that does is you see those start collecting on the, the distal side and they actually start forming this chambered or cavitated structure uh, that starts to beat. Uh, and this beating uh, really has qualities of a heart-like structure. Uh, it, it calcium imaging shows it has a, a consistent beat. Um, so again, this really shows that the wind produced from this spatial node, uh, especially in this very shallow grade, it has higher resolution kind of uh, uh, developmental uh, information content. Uh, we've gone and looked at a lot of these structures and not only do we see uh, markers like cardiac troponin, as well as uh, key transcription factors like NKX 2.5 here. But then also, if you look at this PCAM stains for the endothelial, the vasculature, uh, and you can see that this, this uh, chamber or cavity is associated with this more extensive vasculature network that, that reaches out and extends from that. So the shallower gradient leads to highly localized, but much more organized, self-organized multi-cell lineage structures uh, the, the higher resolution structures, and these are self-organized. So, of course, a different approach that's very powerful is to drive things into specific lineages and then assemble different ones together. Uh, but that that really isn't sort of self-organization in the same way that we see here. Okay, so here's how we're thinking about these approaches that we're just starting, which is that a lot of um, in vitro differentiation are these sort of lineage specific differentiations where some cocktail or protocol of stimulation leads to very specific cell lineages. And you can start thinking about assembloids where you start putting them different ones together, uh, mixing them together afterwards. In, in opposed to that, the other extreme is sort of these synthetic embryos gastroloids or these uh, synthetic IETX embryos. Um, here, you know, the simulation is meant to try to stimulate all lineages and really kind of create the whole body plan, uh, at least at some level, in a self-organizing way. And what we think is that synthetic organizers allow us to explore the space in between this. They can, uh, be, that we can pro probably depending on what morphogens we use and kind of the steepness of the gradients, we can get a tunable range of lineages. And within this, we think they can self-organize like these hearts. Uh, and that um, uh, we might get more refined development of these kinds of select 
select regions. And then in addition, there's the possibility that we can actually push things into very non-native outcomes that could lead to tissues that are useful in other unexpected kinds of ways. So just to summarize, we've shown that we can engineer these programmable and autonomously assembling synthetic organizer cells that self-assemble and provide more vigilance critically from uh, uh, specific spatial locations. It's a way to really control uh, chemical and spatial and temporal signals. We actually have drug-inducible and, and, uh, and, and suicide switches that allow us to control when these, uh, uh, um, these organizers work. Uh, but this information-rich spatial gradients created by these can lead more complex uh, multi-cell type tissues like this chambered heart associated with uh, vas this uh, vascular network as well as um, AP uh, axis organization. Um, and the gradient really shapes the range and resolution of development. Uh, and that these provide a new set of ways to more quantitatively try to steer development with coordinated control of spatial, temporal, and chemical inputs. And we are very interested in exploring how these tools can be used to drive the development and self-organization of structures like the pancreas or islets, which of course are made of multiple cell types integrated in a very specific developmental pattern. Um, and so uh, to tie everything together, I've told you about some of the tools um, that we've tried to develop as fundamental tools to change how we can wire cellular networks together um, and showed uh, our uh, early efforts at trying to engineer synthetic suppressor cells that can block the action of say CAR T cells in vitro and in vivo in very bespoke ways that could be used to protect uh, uh, tissues like islets, whether it's endogenous ones or transplanted ones. And really we think these are gonna be a nice complement or alternative depending on the use for things like therapeutic Tregs. Um, and then I talked about the work on synthetic organizers, uh, engineering self-assembling cells that produce morphogens in a way that coordinates spatial, temporal, and chemical signals to, to drive development in controlled ways. Uh, and these are, we can get tunable spatial gradients and observe how these alter the outcomes and perhaps can get um, uh, more refined development of multi-cell tissues like islets and pancreas. Uh, and let me just end by thanking uh, all of you, but also the people who did the work, Nish, uh, Hasna, Ini, uh, I think who's on the call, Matthias and, and Audrey are great collaborators. And then of course, um, Toshi and Cora Lee for the synthetic organizer work, as well as Adam Stevens, Benoit uh, and Ophir. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take questions. That's terrific. Thank you, Wendell. You packed in a lot in a little bit of time and it was clear and, and, and lovely. So what I'll ask the audience to do, because I recognize there's a lot of names here, Wendell, of people that are working on things that uh, that you've talked about here. So I'm sure you have questions. Um, you can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand um, and then I'll uh, I'll call on you to, to ask these questions. Um, if you're having trouble unmuting yourself, please let me know and we'll we'll get you unmuted if if that's the case. While I'm waiting because I don't see anybody yet, I'm just checking uh, Wendell when I, when I don't see anybody yet. So Wendell, could you tell me a little bit more about what you envision with these suppressor cells essentially protecting transplants and um, how durable or, or long lasting is, is that effect and how does that compete against the native immune system? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I think, one of the questions that we still have to deal with is how, you know, I mean, is this something, I mean, I guess, you know, part of, uh, there's a lot of different types of applications for different autoimmune diseases. I mean, I think it'd be great to have, say, um, suppressor cells that are allogeneic and that you can, you know, that we have a, they're off the shelf and we could give uh, uh, at you know whenever whenever we want that's one one thing on the other hand it would be good you know uh to to think about um uh how do you make how do you really make these resident in a in a say like a transplanted tissue what are the the um you know survival uh, cytokines etc things like that so i think there's there's kind of i think there's there's different branches here that are could be useful um for different uh, applications um, but, uh, um, yeah, those are, those are great questions. Thank you, Wendell. Leo. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'll actually follow up on this question. So for example, in mouse cells, if you take naive CD4 T cells and give them TGF-beta IL-2, they become T-rays with FOXP3 and everything. So have you seen the, 
you've shown the functional effect of this uh, synthetic suppressor T cells. Have you looked at the suppressor T cells themselves? Do they change over time? Do they also turn on genes that you'd expect? Can you kind of, you know, reverse engineer in a way? Can you give birth? Yeah, to I, I, I mean, that's a great birth? question. I, um, you know, um, I mean, we've done some characterization. I'm trying to uh, uh, think, I mean, Nish is on the call. Do, do you, I mean, I don't know uh, uh, if we've seen any clear yes or no signals about these becoming T-regs or any subpopulation. Do you, Nish, do you want to? Yeah, so we've um, cultured these cells for a while and kept them active through the Synotch and stained for FOXP3 and Helios, and they don't adopt um, a T-reg-like fate. Um, so they seem to be uh, inert, but still maintain this kind of traditional effector fate. Yeah, and that's one of the big questions is like, I mean, for all of these, whether it's T-reg or these synthetic cells, you know, how stable can you keep them and not the, make them, you know, turn into effector cells, et cetera, yeah. Because also from the TR1 cell world, right? This TR1 cells, type 1 regulatory cells, they don't express FOXP3. They still make a ton of IL-10 and they generate in vivo. So again, I'm just, I was just curious. So it seems as if the cells are inert to their own signals that they're secreting uh, for, for protection. Uh, at least from the analysis we've done so far, yeah. Terrific, thank you, Leo. Good, good question. Um, any other questions for Dr. Lim? Hi, this is Luis Borlado. Um, I have a question. Hi. Um, hi, what is the durability of the treatment with these cells? So, when you put these cells into into the animals or in the patients, how long the cell will remain there and, and sustain the fat? Yeah, I mean the the what I would say is these cells need to have uh, IL two from from the inflammatory cells. So they um, the, uh, once those are gone, um, I mean the death the population definitely goes down. In terms of you know longer term survival, we we don't really have a clear answer yet. Um, but but that's I mean in in many ways that's a good thing. Um, the question is you know I mean we would like to be able to have. Um, uh, longer term survival, at least the subpopulation of these, um, and do so in a in a sort of resident way. <laughs> Nish, did you have anything else to say there? Yeah, we do, we don't have a, a clear answer to how how long they um, survive, but at least in vitro we know that they're dependent on getting IL two from right. you know cytotoxic T cells that are producing. But I was thinking mainly, for instance, in chronic uh, inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis in which you can have peaks and, and relapse. So if you will need to do an, in, an administration in the patient every time that you have a relapse or, or if the cells will remain circulating in the body and then when whenever there is inflammation, they're going to be activated and produce immunosuppression. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, you know, as I said before, if, if you had off the shelf allogeneic ones, be less of a problem to do that. Um, but and depending on the severity of the disease, but then also um, if you can have both kind of a, a, a highly proliferative IL-2 mediated response, but a, some kind of survival basal uh, signal that's tissue specific, that that would be great. Mm -hmm. That's a phase waste one. Good. Another question. Uh, any potential risk? I mean, we're talking on, on recently the FDA published a communication uh, related with the potential risk of the CAR T-cells. And in this case, I guess that the translation that to the clinic, it will be something similar in the sense that you're going to use polyclonal population, right? In which you will yeah. uh, transduce this kind of construct there. Have you observed any kind of uh, potential toxicity or, or, or um, I mean, issues? you know, we haven't, I mean, you know, and, and of course the CAR T is, is a much more potent um, acute, you know, Problem, potential problem generator than um, kind of remod suppressing a, a, an environment. So, I mean, we certainly, I'm sorry, we certainly have um, seen that, you know, our effects are very local um, uh, because of the, the synotch targeting. Um, so, but, but I mean, my general feeling is that the, the, if you're not talking about killing, um, you're, you're not going to see, um, it's not going to be, as severe, but you know, I mean, you could have sort of medium local suppressive effects. 
I was I was thinking more on producing some kind of tumor so that the engineering of the cells impact on any tumor suppressor or tumor uh, or oncogen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you are going so, to have a, an immunosuppressor environment in which uh, the cells can proliferate indefinitely. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I mean, yes, you can always turn, turn this around. I mean, that comes down to, um, as we said, uh, the 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 specificity of the targeting and the severity of the disease and the risks that you want to take. Um, uh, you know, I mean, these are all, you know, all the, the diseases of cancer and autoimmunity are this balance. And um, I do think we can squeeze a lot, uh, you know, a lot more out of that, you know, reconfiguring mm -hmm. that balance, but it's it's still always there. Okay. But at some point during the during the talk, you were talking about kill switch. I don't know if you were considering at some point. Can you uh, mention about that? Sure, there are um, caspase uh, uh, activated um, uh, switches that are small molecule um, uh, uh, mediated. Uh, there are a bunch of different things along those lines. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good questions. Any, any, okay, Audrey, hi. Oh, okay, Audrey. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who's can't not very familiar to you at all, Wendell, huh? <laughs> Hi, Audrey. I actually have a question about the part that I was not as familiar with, uh, the okay. organizer cells. Yeah. How much temporal control do you have over these, these cells? Because when we do the differentiation, we can control when we put a specific growth factors and then when we rem remove it by just changing to a different media. Yeah. So when you're having yeah. a cell secreted, can you turn it off easily? So... Yes, I mean we have um, made the, the morphisms under Doc's control. I mean we can change the control, and we also have suicide switches built in. Um, so uh, we 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 do have that kind of control, and we've used some of it. But I mean that's that's uh, we're starting to really try to look at that better. Yeah. Okay, and I guess could you have it controlled by the response of the other cell, like when you yes. That is that is that's our ultimate dream, and we are trying to do things like that, where you know you're really starting to get more feedback. I mean, things like recognizing um, uh, new uh, lineage-specific markers that emerge, or to actually have one morphogen talk to it, you know, could regulate another morphogen. That things that actually the kind of really powerful feedback that happens um, in the natural systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Audrey. That's terrific. Okay, I'm looking through here. See if we've got any any more questions. Probably flooded people with too much information. No, it, it, it was great though, Wendell. I mean, it gives a good it gives a good picture of what you're doing and and the different um, lanes that you're swimming in. And I think it's helpful to a lot of people here that are that are working in these different areas. Um, yeah, if people have other questions, sort of have to mull things over. I'm happy to to you know um, get emails or whatever or set up a time. Yeah, that's great. Um, Sherry, who I'm, I'm Sherry Stabler from uh, UF, uh, complimenting your work in the in the chat. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to give one last call for any any questions. You can unmute yourself or. Or ask Wendell um, what you'd like. There's always an opportunity to follow up uh, as well directly. Okay, another another person complimenting you, uh, Methi, um, saying you had a great talk. Indeed. Um, before everyone takes off, um, we are we are having another talk on January 11th, I believe that is, and that's going to be Yuval Dor, who's going to bring us in to the new year. So. We left this year with a great talk and we'll start the year off with, with another great one. So again, Wendell, thank you and your team for putting this all together and for fielding all these. Well, thank you. And, and and I just want to say to everyone here, like we, we are very interested in, you know, pursuing, you know, the, the ideas that we talked about further uh, and um, really would value input or suggestions. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. We'll see you. Bye -bye. We'll see you next month. Bye-bye.